Welcome to At The Core, the intersection between neuroscience and fitness, where I have the joy and opportunity to speak to high performance movers and better understand and tap into their mindset of how they use brain health and neuroscience to improve their movement skills. Today's special guest is Dario Costa. Dario's passion for flying was ignited as a toddler. You can see through these clips how he trains, how he flies, and how he moves. Dario performed his first solo in 1996 and in no time became the youngest flight and aerobatics instructor in Italy. Now, he is a world-recognized professional Red Bull Air Race competitor, stunt pilot, aero acrobatic performer, flight instructor, and paradropping pilot. Dario is the first ever Italian to qualify to compete and win in the Red Bull Air Race World Series. He is well known for his various world first flying stunts and world records, including in 2021, was awarded with the Guinness World Record of the first and longest ever flight through a tunnel at 245 miles per hour. Welcome, Dario, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Pleasure. Nice to see you, Misha. I don't know how else to start this conversation than to dive straight in. I. I thought and thought about what should be my first question. And, and to be honest with you, the first thing that comes to mind with everything you go through is these G-forces. The magnitudes of value is, are expressed numerically, you know, with pulling Gs. And possibly someone on a roller coaster is experiencing one, two Gs maybe on the worst roller coasters possible, three Gs. And if I explain some of these G-forces, and I would love to hear your thoughts on, on how this all works truly in the body. G-forces, for example, they basically say it's like three times or two times your body weight. So if you are 200 pounds, you feel like you're 600 pounds if you're experiencing three Gs. And as a Red Bull Air Race pilot, navigating at low level aerial race tracks made up of air filled pylons that you have to avoid flying at speeds reaching 230 plus miles per hour while withstanding forces of what might be up towards 10 g forces this this equivalents to someone being feeling like they're 2000 pounds how do you prepare your body for that how how do these g forces work for you and and how do you not pass out like the average person <laughs> That's going to pass out a lot sooner. <laughs> yeah, we we are. I mean, we are not allowed to go over twelve Gs, so that's 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 our limit, and also the airplane limit. But sometimes we go over that, but we have to really be careful. Um, I mean, G force, as you said, it's it's basically the amount of 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 the feeling that you have of your weight. But in reality, G force doesn't really exist. So it's just it's just a numerical value to give to give a value of what of what your your body would like to do when you change your direction. So we have to think about inertia. So basically, we're going like straight forward, and then some point I'm pulling up the airplane, and the plane wants to go up. You know, so it it means that my whole uh, body it's linked and connected to the airplane with the seat belts. So we are physically going upwards. But the blood that is and the organs that are inside the body and are and are free to move, they they would like to stay in their initial position. So mm -hmm. this this will will not allow or will really restrict your blood to get to your brain as usually does, and that's why you you basically pass out and and, and that's called loss of consciousness due to G. So G lock, the loss of consciousness due to G force. Um, this feeling is unique in the airplanes because when you go, you were saying about roller coaster. When you go on a roller coaster, uh, when you go or, or on a car, or on a Formula One car, or Indy car, or a motorbike, you basically don't feel the vertical G force, which is the one I just explained to you, which takes, which is influencing your organs and your blood. So you don't really pass out. But what you have in that case is the frontal and the lateral G forces. 
where your head, which is not, which is the only part that is free to move, and the rest of the body is, is strapped to the to the car, for example, will continue together with the car to the left and to the right. But the head will continue to the initial, will be in the initial position. So your neck will have to to cope with that a lot, not to have the head moving left and right. So in reality, it's 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 the rest of the body that is moving. It's not the blood. So the blood is in is in the initial position when we go vertical up or vertical down, oh, and in that case will be negative cheese. So what we have to do is to is to really think about all those micro muscles that are working to keep the blood in that to keep the blood in that position so that we can carry it together with the rest of the body. And the same is the rest of the body. At the same time, we have to keep our head, of course, that wants to go backwards or, or forward uh, together with the rest of the body. So the, the neck muscles come, comes in. And then we have to think that while we are pulling those, um, those Gs, those, that value of Gs, we need to continue flying. So then you have to consider that you keep, you keep your eyes on, on, your, on, your, on your track where you want to go and you can't really move your head because if you move your head while you're pulling the G-force, then your head will 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 just snap. So you need to keep your head quite straight. So I can't do this while I'm pulling G-force. It's very, very uh, tricky. Uh, so you need to use your peripheral vision. You need to use your sight. You need, you know, you need to use all your senses. You need to use all your muscles, even if you're strapped in an airplane and you think that you're not moving. But in reality, you are controlling the pedals with your feet. So your legs are working. You need to continue moving your stick with your right hand. And with your left hand, you need to continue controlling the power. So all these things, you have to do it while the body wants to go at 12 Gs. Amazing. So let's break this down a little bit. You, you've you gone into a lot of the things that are so important for the neuromechanics and someone feeling safe and capable and working at faster and faster speeds. Let's start with the neck. Obviously, the muscles in the neck need to be incredibly strong, incredibly durable, and not just resilient, but able to feel and sense micro movements so they can adjust just as quickly. How do you go about your training to provide this to you? What type of things do you do um, that help you build up neck strength and neck stability through this type of work? I mean, it's, it's really simple. You need to try to replicate what, what you want to do uh, in, in this case in, the, in, the, in a racetrack. So what, what, I'm, what I'm doing is, is doing everything that, that I want uh, to train. So for example, am I training the core? Okay, so I train the core and while I'm training the core, I will also put some weight on my neck or somebody will pull my neck right, right left in, in different directions so that that it's, it's going to be kind of instinctive for me to always have some load on my neck while I'm doing other things. So in this way, my focus is not actually on the neck, is, is on the other thing. For example, for example, mm -hmm. catching balls or catching uh, uh, colored sticks that I have, that I have to, to, to catch the right color that the coach is, is, uh, is calling or doing mathematics uh, calculations while I'm touching the light that turns on first. Uh, all these kind of stuff. But at this, while I'm doing this, I need to, I need to, I need also to cope with with the resistance that I feel on the neck. That it makes it more and more uh, natural for me to have something pulling. So when when it stops, actually I feel like okay, something is wrong because nobody's pulling my neck from <laughs> from the back or something like that. You know, it's just to get used. To, the whole body has to get used to those loads that, that I have so that I can feel as much as possible comfortable when I'm pulling G's. So that is not something that surprises me. And you right. know, that there, there is this uh, common answer that most of the pilots says, um, yeah, the best way to train for G-force is pulling G-force. But what do I do when for six months I have snow outside and I cannot fly? So it's easy to say when you live in California like you, but for me that I live in Austria, I had to fly today and I couldn't, you know, so flight canceled because it's, it's cloudy and I'm in the middle of the mountain. So I was, I've been always thinking, what do I do when I can't fly? What do I do to save also uh, money to fly? Because it's, it's not that cheap to fly. So what, what, what can a young pilot do to train for G-Force when, it doesn't have the possibility to fly two, three times per day. 
And I tell you this because when I don't fly for a month, when I come back, when, when I used to fly, not fly for a month, and I used to come back and fly, the first three flights were all gone just for reactivating my body to the mm -hmm. G-force. Luckily, we have a very good muscle memory, so it's not that difficult to get back to that kind of breathing technique, that kind but still the muscles are, are not ready for that, you know, if you don't train them. So that's why I started to, to develop together with rebel coaches to develop a training that can help people that wants to keep their um, uh, G-force technique, let's say G-straining technique and, and the whole body and the brain ready for the day that, that, that it's time to fly again. You mentioned uh, breathing techniques. Uh, we we come back to this every single podcast, the, how important breathing is. And there's not to say that any specific breathing pattern is best. It's what's best for that sport or for that person. And being a Pilates instructor, I repeat the importance of breathing a hundred times a day. And I'm always fascinated with how the different types of breath work and how these different techniques are needed to perform a specific task at a high level. Um, but you have to perform a specific breathing sequence I've never heard of. And you must execute a series of breathing and straining techniques, um, as I've understood, in, in 0.1 seconds, which is faster than most people blink. Um, <sighs> and if I understand this correctly, you have to um, keep your lungs filled you must push out the air between your lips and tense up your calves, your thighs, your glutes, and your stomach, all in that 0.1 second as you're about to take the G-forces. Can you talk about this a little bit? Can you explain how this happens? Maybe even someone that wants to learn how to start changing their breath, become resilient in breathing, what your thoughts are and what your tips are. I mean, you, you said it all. I mean, you, you explained quite well what is the standard technique for, for the so-called GIST training maneuver. So um, we, we, need, we need, of course, to use a lot the core, and then we need to make sure that we don't, we don't finish our oxygen inside. So that otherwise, we, as, as we discussed before, we, we are going to just uh, uh, pass out. No? So we're going to lose our conscience. So it's, it's a really... Basically, it's it's a really natural breathing after a while that you do it. It's not something that 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 it's out of. I mean, it's it's really really easy to learn it. I have to say, it's not something very complex. The only thing is the timing, as you said, so that you do it in the right timing, in the right moment, and not too late. Otherwise, it doesn't really work. Um, so yeah, it's it's a combination of breathing and use of your core. And, and the core is really, really important. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm focusing a lot on developing trainings on the core, uh, because that's, that's, your, that's your insurance basically, not to pass out, but also to uh, protect your spine. So I'm not talking only of, of the core, uh, the, mm -hmm. the normal abs, but also the, uh, the oblique abs, for example. So yeah. all, the, all the core, it's, it's really important. Um, so that's, that's why it's, it's quite complex. So it's not just breathing, but it's tightening your core and using the core to, to, to block everything there and then breathing very quickly. But what I do is I have very short breath, but with a very high frequency. So basically I keep them on the very, very top and never finishing them all. So they're very, very short. So I, I never go, I don't know in English how you say, but I never get to, to, the, to the end yeah. of the breath. Yes. Um Okay, so that's, that's, that's how we do it, to keep it high. And yes, you have to be very fast, but in reality, it's very long because we keep that, that kind of, of, of breathing for more than five seconds because when we do a maneuver in the air race, we have to keep it more than five seconds. So we are going to start, of course, at the peak of the, we call it at the onset G, so the G onset, so basically the peak we get immediately. And then the energy of the plane, of course, starts with drag to, to reduce and the G force also reduces till the apex of it and then and then we are we are basically at the end of the of the high g's uh, but it's it's more than 5 seconds that you have to keep that technique even more sometimes so it's really important that you know the technique very well because otherwise you can keep it for 4 seconds and then you have one other second and is and is and is done you know so you have to continue basically forever you have to be able to keep that technique forever or the longest time that you can and to be able to recall it very quickly and to be yes at your disposable whenever you need it. 
yes it's kind it gets it has it will get like a skill you know so it's it's kind of automatic your body recognizes what's happening and and it just it just goes for that but you you really have to also to personalize it to your to your feeling so i talked to other other competitors in the air race and i saw some videos of them how they breathe and 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 we are all different you know uh, for example i tend to i tend to also um yeah i mean not but most of the time i tend to scream while i'm i'm starting it and i saw that some others they don't really they don't really they don't really open the mouth so it's it's really it's really personalized so i would not say that there is a generic one that is the one mm -hmm. that you that you explain but it's really it's really specific then each of us will will learn and modify and tailor make the, the, their own technique uh seeing how they feel how they perform and uh, that's quite our that that's quite secret we don't know really what we do exactly so, so each of us has his own one I, I have read, you know, continuing on this idea of G-forces because it does impact so many things. As you said, your breathing, your reaction timing, your contraction of your muscles, but also we talked about vision and we using your peripherals and things like that. And I read about these G-forces that um, as we approach seven Gs, and maybe this is different as you train and, and you have your body accustomed to it, but that people start to see in black and white and that your vision shrinks and because we're going into these potentially pr more protective measures for the average person, um, our peripherals shrink and what we can see around us and going into this tunnel vision. Um, first of all, does that happen to you? Do you see things in black and white versus in color at, at different times of your racing? Um, how do you stay alert? How do you maintain your peripheral vision? Um, and, and of course, uh, for our audience, how do you train that? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the gray out or the gray vision and then and then the blackout or the uh, complete tunnel vision, let's say. So where, where the vision, it's because you don't get the, the blood and the oxygen to your brain. So that's the that's the problem. So if you have a G-straining technique that works, you should not get that. But of course, as I told you, when we are not flying for a long time or we are not training for that for a long time and we get back, at the first flight, it's very easy that you get that gray, of course, not or the tunnel vision. Of course, we don't pass out. I mean, we are very trained. As I said, our bodies have a very good muscle memory. So we immediately recognize what we have to do. And we, we, we avoid pulling very high Gs at the first flight. So, for example, if I'm not flying since a couple of months and I go up and I, and I, and I, and I try the first, the first pull is going to be just four or five Gs, not more, you know, and then I will then my brain will start to understand where we are and then my technique will get better, my timing will get better, but for sure I need to, to do it for, for one, two, three flights maybe, you know? So that's, that's we call it G warm-up also at the beginning of each flight. So even if we flew the day before, we need to, to warm up our body to, to, get, to get ready for that again. So we can't really go up on a plane and pull 12 Gs and pretend that we don't have the tunnel vision. So it's quite normal to have that. And that's because the tra the gist training technique is not properly applied. So we have I to just to regain, especially the timing for for what concerns me, my personal experience. So I I, I get to I need to get it better in timing. Uh, so I know how to do it, but the timing is wrong. So I need to just to get used to it again. That's very very interesting. You know, when you talk about timing. I, I was looking up again, you know, the speeds that you are going, the reaction that you have 268 miles per hour is the speed in which the fastest signals travel an alpha motor neuron through our spinal cord. And that's the fastest such transmission known currently in the human body. That's not that far off from the fastest <sighs> speed you have traveled. And the speeds you travel with the stunts you perform not only require an immense level of reactive training, in my mind, it also requires quite a bit of reflexive training. And you've talked about this. You said it feels natural. It, it just comes. It happens. Um, also, changes in airflow and highly sensitive to steering um, requirements, these reactive trainings um, of, of having to work within 250 milliseconds. For someone who does not do any of this, for someone who wants to improve their reaction time in whatever sport they have or 
you know, the senior listening to this and wanting to improve their reaction time in driving, how, what are your suggestions? What are things that people can do? So first of all, you need to train. I mean, you need to practice that somehow. And, uh, and the other suggestion, which was one of the key changes that I did in my case, uh, when I started to train for the tunnel was the breathing. So I was not breathing when I was training, when I was trying those exercises that you showed before. So I was doing them in apnea. So I was not really breathing and I was, and that was really uh, re reducing or increasing the, the reaction time, of course. The whole body wants oxygen, as we know. So, so the first thing that I had to focus on and do is to remind myself to breathe uh, in an almost natural way. Of course, I changed a little bit that to, to be able to move myself so fast, but I had to remind myself to breathe and, 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 and breathe properly. And that was the first step that, that improved my reaction time. And the rest was just to increase the difficulty. So, um, as I said before, um, what, what I'm trying to do when I'm in off season or pre season, when the weather is not good to fly, is to simulate and replicate what happens in the plane. And as I discussed, as I explained to you before, we are using the core a lot, but we are using all the other muscles also, but not big muscles. So I'm not pushing with my legs uh, 40 kilos, you know, I'm just pushing tiny bit the, the pedals and in a very, very, very precise way. So the best way to simulate that is to be on a balance board. And I found it very, very helpful. So putting myself on the balance board and then putting myself with the neck pull by, by the trainer from the back in different direction, plus putting myself in front of this reaction time board. So these lights that comes off on and I have to, to, to switch them off, hitting them. So all this together made that exercise very difficult. So when I remove everything I have, so no balance board, no elastic band, then my reaction time is is quite fast. So it, it's just making it more difficult to, to help myself to, to improve. Like we do every time, you know, you, you don't, you don't train 100 for getting to 100, you train for 200 to get to, to get, to be very good at 100, you know? And so, so that's, that's the, that's what we actually did as a first thing. So it's just to replicate what was happening in the plane and making it even, even harder even harder. So there are different, different other things we did, but of course this is, I would say this is the easiest for anybody to do, to do. So just put add, add difficulties. You um, have been flying for a very, very long time. You've been in the sport, but also flying in general for a very long time. This idea of neuroplasticity, of variables, adding cognitive load, adding brain training to things, is more of a newer concept. Um, when did you see that change? Being that you've been in the sport, being that you've been in flying for a long time, when did you see that change? Because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, like you said, pushing weight, it used to look like a typical gym goer and your workouts, though incredibly intense and very fatiguing, are 80% brain derived, cognitive drive, and then muscular down. When did you see that change? I mean, what do you mean with change? You mean, when did I see the when change? Oh, yeah. When did that approach change for you? Or when did, when did you see it entering uh, the sports world for you and air racing or p pilots in general to start using more neuroplastic cognitive loading to actually improve their physical skill sets? I mean, there are, there are different, there are different things in, in normal flying, let's call it normal, but I, I, mm. I mean the non sportive sporting fly. So no racing and no stunt flying. So normal flying, we have so many inputs and we have to react to so many things that, that it's normal that, that we can, we can improve our performance, uh, even on a normal flight, you know? So you have the first thing that they, they teach you is the scanning. The scanning is, is a very, very important technique where you are basically scanning uh, different instruments plus the horizon if you're flying in visual, visual flight. And if you're flying in instrument flying, it's, instead of the horizon, you have an artificial horizon. But the te that, that was the very first time, and I was like a student, I was a student, I was 16 years old, where I realized that 
oh my god but we we have to really i mean push our brain it's not just it's not just learning the technique of flying like moving the hands and going we need we need to scan so scanning one was one second given a, attention to one instrument per time in the in a specific sequence which was giving your brain the right information to be coordinated so to keep the plane in the right altitude at the right speed without climbing without descending without going to the right without going to the left because because looking outside only was not enough so you had to scan still inside to have a confirmation from those instruments and then you were back outside and then you were back inside to another instrument so it's a very basic technique but it's the first thing that you, that, that an instructor has to teach you and and was for me that was already the moment that i thought okay this is very cool i love it because it's not just you know it's just not just learning learning to to move your hand and your feet you have to you have to apply some 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 technique where you need to think about and you need to you need to use all your all your senses and, it, and this was this was very nice Steve decide react there needs to be that constant change we spoke to yeah. one of our guests and it was this constant what do you perceive how do you decide what to do with it how do you react to it and the faster you can make that cycle and constantly cycle through it the better your reaction time would be of course i mean we have different way to react we have the knowledge base the rule base and the skill based so the skill base is basically when we have the stick in our hand and we have to we have kind of turbulence and we react to the turbulence or we have to go to the left and we go to the right you know you just it's just is is a muscle reaction basically it's very instinctive it's very fast is the fastest way then there are rule based reaction that that are based on rules like checklist or or sequence of of things that you have to do to get to the result and then there is the knowledge page which which is the slowest one but it's actually the most efficient one because it's the one that anal analyzes every single detail to get to your to your decision so the, to to have your decision making process in the best of the ways and, and this is very cool i mean i've always been very interested and I've always been trying to teach uh, teach my students to to really know about these three ways of reacting because if it's an emergency and your skill base and your rule base doesn't work you need to you need to find a solution with the knowledge base so you need to to go down and check every single detail do an attempt and see and so this means to go back to your knowledge to so, so to the theory of flying which which i'm very passionate of too so this is this is very cool and there are things that that we have to be careful our brain is sometimes uh very tricky with with like complacency for example is one of the topics that i always touch and we need to be very very careful so um the tunnel pass was was the project where i managed finally to put together all these uh let's say subjects that i had always in mind and i was very very passionate about and put them all together and say okay to 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 solve this problem which is which was the tunnel pass we need all the knowledge and all the skills and all the rules that we 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 can to make it to make it work properly because we don't really know what is going to happen nobody ever done it you know now it's going to be easier for anybody that wants to do it because has been done so darius done it so let's see what he did so but first we had a huge question mark and we didn't know if what we we plan and what we trained for was was correct so it's one of those projects where you have to to really do it properly and perfectly because every single mistake can lead to a disaster so there are less than 50 milliseconds of reaction that you can have if the plane goes in the wrong direction it has is a couple of meters to the right couple of meters to the left couple of meters on top and and 30 centimeter to the ground which was my biggest care you know so my biggest fear so it's it's really you need to really do everything properly it's not enough to have your you know your basic knowledge to 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 solve the to solve this problem you need to really take knowledge from from anybody that can give you scientists trainers physiotherapists mental coach sports psychologists everybody gave me an input and gave me something that 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 made this project safe and and and, and successful every single detail has been taken into account when you talk about every single detail uh it's very interesting to me because as i read more and more about your tunnel pass and the the efforts it took there were things that came up to me that I had never considered. And I'm sure 
with all these expertise and and people surrounding you having different thoughts and input that that really did help. But one of the things that surprised me was this idea that um, there were gaps in the tunnel, which would change the wind significantly as you pass through at these high speeds. Um, what type of things came about in approaching this tunnel pass, preparing yourself for this tunnel pass? What were some of the things that you had not had to consider before with flying out in space without these obstacles? Yeah, first of all, the light. So it was dark and then was light again and then was dark again. And when it was dark, there was this bright light that was, you know, when you, when you drive to a tunnel, you have this light, uh -huh. like it's a strobe light. So I, we added to train for this, we simply added strobe glasses to all my trainings. So whatever I was doing, I was doing for, I was training three times a week, five hours. And for those five hours or almost those five hours of training, or of course, when it was passive physiotherapy, no, but whenever we were doing something that was active, I was wearing those glasses. And then there was, there was a reaction time, because as you said, the, the engineers did a 3D scan of the airplane, put it in a computer and, and, and they analyzed every single meter in the second tunnel. And they realized that because you go into a tunnel, you are pushing air forward and this air comes back in form of waves when they hit obstacles in the tunnel, you know, all these were analyzed and we found that they found out that there were three biggest, there were five waves, but the three of them were very big and they were pushing me down or pushing me up. So for example, at the entrance of tunnel number two, there was a wave that was pushing me upward in 250 milliseconds. So I had to react in less than 250 milliseconds, but not only react like if someone calls you and you, and you, and you just turn around, not if you catch a ball, yeah. if, like catch a big ball. It was like catching a mini ball, you know, exactly, precisely. So I couldn't over control the airplane. I had to be careful. Otherwise I had no space, you know, it's not just pulling. And when you're out in the space, you just react to the turbulence and that's okay. You know, that's, that's, that's all react. You have open space. You have all okay. the, the space that you want, basically, in in absolute, let's say, in a in a theoretical way. Uh, so we we had to we had to work on reaction time, and then there were other things, uh, for example, like the the noise. You know, the noise inside the tunnel was complete completely different. Was was a constant noise. But the biggest thing that, or the biggest thing, not but one of one of the biggest effort was to blink in the right moment. So if, if you check the, the video, you see that I basically almost don't blink. And, right. uh, and one, of my pro one of my problem when I was visualizing with the, with the sport psychologist, I was visualizing the whole run of 40 seconds when I was visualizing it and, and training my reaction time during the visualization, um, I was not blinking. So I was so focused that I, I, I couldn't blink. I was just because we know that when in a plane like the one I used, which is the most dynamic and reactive airplane uh, in the world, so it's the fastest machine in, 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 in changing direction, basically. So you think it and it's already changed. If you look to the right, the plane will go to the right, you know, <laughs> even if it goes few centimeters in a, in a tunnel, it's a disaster. So what I had to do is to really focus on keeping my eye on my aiming point, which couldn't be the center line, for example. Many have written, oh, okay, you just keep the center line. No, you can't look at the center line because if you look at the center line, you just hit the ground. That's, I tried it. I tried it on the runway and you just hit the ground, you know. It's just the, the runway and the, the tunnel was going uphill and then was changing, uh, going uh, almost downhill at 500 meters from the exit. So for 1.2 kilometers, you had to go uphill and then you had to change your aiming point and go downhill. And I couldn't see the exit. So my aiming point was imaginary. So it was, I was just imagining to have that aiming point at the top of that climb inside the second tunnel. And then the aiming point has changed. So basically I had to, I had to learn how to blink in specific times because of course, the sport psychologist told me, Dario, you need to blink. You need to clean your eyes. Otherwise, it's, it, your, your sight is going to be uh, corrupted. You know, it's going to be not as good as, as, the, mm -hmm. as, the, as you want. So we decided. So he said, basically, he told me, Dario, just decide the, the, the critical, the right after the critical part. So uh, I decided to do it after the takeoff at the exit of tunnel number one. 
because the takeoff was for me very critical because this airplane to take off uh, usually in that way it requires a lot of energy because the plane was just to go up uh, in the space. Mm -hmm. It is it's very powerful. It's very light. As I told you, it's very, it's very uh, yeah. reactive. So that was my first critical part. And then the second critical part for me was the entrance of the second tunnel because there was the, the, the first big pressure wave that was pushing me upwards and I wanted to be at 30 centimeters. So I had enough space in case I was slow to react. But if you see in slow-mo, the plane goes up, but very little. I think it goes up just five centimeters. Then I, I managed to control it. And then the third part was right after the shape of the tunnel from round becomes square, which is a 1.2 kilometers. Uh, that was the, 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 the other big pressure way I was worried about a little bit before that there was this pressure way that was pushing me downwards so I wanted to be a 70 centimeter there so in case it was pushing me and I was slow I had enough space before touching the ground and if you check the video you will see me blinking after right after these three three critical points and then I'm looking down just a few meters before the exit looking at the speed to make sure that I have enough speed because I, I never looked at the speed the whole flight so I just blinked three times and then I'm looking down to make sure I have the right speed to pull some G's at the exit because the exit then is turning and I need to pull up quickly otherwise I have to follow the road turning and which is something I didn't want to do so I just quickly look down but of course I'm just a few meters from the exit so the job was was basically done but if you look at the video in the last meters I'm drifting to the left so when I'm looking to the instrument and my speed instrument is in the left side of my plane, in the, of my instrument mm -hmm. panel, you see the plane drifting one meter from the center line, which never happened the whole run. So for the whole run, I was straight on the center line. And then the last few meters, right after I look down to look at the instrument at the speed indicator, you see the plane drifting to the left, which proves that if I was not aiming, looking at my aiming point the whole time, I would have for sure crashed. Oh my gosh. It's unreal. You know, obviously you, this was a huge endeavor, huge project. Um, you have a family, you have a kid. Uh, there's, there's a lot that you have to strip your mind of to be in this moment, to be as safe as possible. And there's a lot that goes into it um, to make you feel as safe as possible. Ultimately, um, you know, at some point you, you decided this was the day we were going to do it, you know? I was, you were ready, as ready as could be, conditions. How, what do you do? Do you have, did you have something you did for that tunnel pass? Do you have something you do every single time as a ritual to prepare yourself mentally for any flight or any, you know, world record, first stunts? I mean, you've done a lot of different things that have been a first thing. But particularly with this tunnel pass, something that no one's ever done before with such exactitude for such danger and, and risk of death. Um, is there anything you have that you do to prepare yourself for these missions mentally? I mean, I, uh, I get this question quite often. And, and, and for me, um, it's very easy to answer. There is, there is no trick. There is no ritual. There is only one thing that I've been doing my whole entire life. I've been telling myself that talent doesn't exist. And if you keep in mind this, you will prepare yourself, you know, for every single moment where you, where the others might feel that you need the talent. And the other thing that you have to have is fear. So being fearless is what ultimately could have killed me in this project or could have destroyed my career, you know, because I, even if I was surviving a crash, still I was the stupid guy that tried to fly through a tunnel. But, but it took me 29 years to get this dream of mine reality. So these 29 years have been telling myself, you don't have any talent, Dario, whatever you want to do, you have to prepare yourself for, you have to respect fear. And this means mitigate every single risk and mitigating the risks means prepare yourself, study, learn, be grounded, you know, be, be, be the one that wants to learn and improve and do your homework. It's really, really easy. And when you get to the point that you feel that you've done what has to be done to be ready for that, and you have respect for the risk that, of what you're doing, 
that's that's my meditation that's my ritual and and i think there is nothing else better than this because this is something concrete of course i can tell you that i listen to music i relax myself uh i can tell you that two weeks before the tunnel pass i switch off my social media for example i was completely offline i didn't want to have any information from outside i blocked all the phone numbers except five numbers just for emergency and just and just the people that i really cared to talk to uh in case i needed but but these are just the alt these, these are part of the homework <laughs> that yeah. i told myself you're not gonna make the tunnel pass just because you're dario costa or just because you're you were born with that talent, you know, you, you, you have to work for that. You have to, and this is what, and this is also the, the goal of this project. This is why, uh, this is why I really like to share information about this project. This is why I really want people to see, because I, I hope that at least one kid out there got inspired from the, from the hard work that was behind this project and, 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 and can dream big and think that he can do whatever he wants, but he has to work for that. He can't, he can't rely on, on his talent. You know, there is, there is no talent. There is no talent out there that could help me to make this, you know, it's just, it's just the will, the passion and, and, and the respect, uh, for all, for the whole project in, in details, let's say for every details of the project. That, that could not have been said better, Dario, that, uh, I hope that with this and anyone listening to this will also see that, as you said, if they want something and they're willing to work for it, it's possible. And, and you've shown that in so many ways. Um, to lighten things up a little bit, Dario, I do something called a lightning round in which I ask you what seems like random questions and you're going to pull out the one that uh, you think of first. What's, the, what, what's your preference and the first thing that comes to mind? Are you ready? No, say again. I didn't understand. So I, Sorry, you were. I, I'm going to ask you. You got questions. frozen a bit. Sorry, I'm you gonna asked? Ask, I'm going to ask you some questions, and um, it's going to be the first thing that comes to mind for you. It's going to be quick options that you'll choose. So the first one: working out, morning, afternoon, or night. Morning. Sweet or salty. Salty. Planks or squats. Uh, squat because I hate them. <laughs> Shoes or barefoot? Barefoot. Coffee or tea? Uh, coffee. Beach or mountains? Beach. Music or silence? Music. Heat or cold? A heat. Inside or outside? Outside. Jasmine or peppermint? Jasmine. Spontaneous or planned? Planned. Learn something new or perfect something known? Learn something new. Dario, uh, this was amazing. This was eye-opening. This was heartfelt. This was inspiring. Um, I could not have asked for more for our listeners from you, for everything you teach. Um, I know we could go on hours and hours and deeper into this discussion of neuroscience and how you apply it uh, day in, day out to improve your skills and your abilities. But is there anything else you would like to share that we did not discuss? Um, anything that you're working on that you want people to know about or anything else? No, actually, you cover it all. It was it was great. It was a great pleasure. Of course, there is a lot we can talk about, but it's 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 gonna be so many different things that that I think that it's 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 really really cool what we talked about. I hope really I really hope that someone uh, will be, let's say, inspired or at least will help someone to to improve what what they're trying to to achieve. Uh, this will be very rewarding for me. So thanks a lot for inviting me. It was a pleasure. I, I appreciate it so much. I feel so honored and incredibly blessed. Um, your hard work and your, as you say, not your talent, but your hard work to create your talent um, <laughs> and to share that with our audience. To all of you listening, if there's anything you got out of this, fly high. Our bodies are adaptable and resilient. Our brains can accomplish much more than you realize. 
Take the small steps to change your abilities to step outside your comfort zone and to experience the possibilities that await you. It's your time to soar. And we'll see you again at the next episode of At The Core.